Good afternoon. Great to have you here at this uh, salon, one of the last uh, performances here of the World Science Festival. And uh, this afternoon's topic is beauty and balance. And we take this occasion to uh, have a discussion about the role of symmetry, symmetry in science and mathematics. I will be representing the sciences, uh, but uh, also in the arts. And I hope this will, for all of us, be a wonderful occasion to have a conversation that might be even more broader ranging about the connection between art and science, about the way we are guided by mathematical principles or not, uh, what our concepts of beauty are, of order, of chaos, of asymmetry. Uh, I think it's just a, a, a grand topic that uh, I hope to explore with my two panelists, but also with you. At some point, I think I would really want to uh, direct, uh, uh, give you the opportunities to ask a few questions. So I think we are uh, all set up for a lovely afternoon. Uh, and I think this is the right moment to call uh, my uh, two participants. As I said, you know, we have the arts represented here, both by uh, design and architecture. And the first participant I want to ask, our first speaker, is the senior curator at the Museum of Modern Art in the Department of Architecture and Design. She's also MoMA's founding director of research and development, and her work investigates design's influence on everyday experience. Please say hello to Paola Antonelli. <laughs> Welcome, Paolo. Uh, please have a seat. And, uh, and then our, our, th our third uh, participant, uh, is, uh, who's also joining us, is the principal architect of Seldorf Architects, a 65-person architectural design practice founded in New York City in 1988. And the firm creates public and private spaces that manifest a clear and modern sensibility to enduring impact. Please welcome architect Annabel Seldorf. Both a warm welcome to uh, two of you, Paul and Annabella. I think uh, we, uh, as I said to the audience, you know, we'll, we'll try to make this as a, interacting a conversation as possible, and at some point also involve the audience. And we have kind of a grand topic today because it's although we were asked to speak about the role of symmetry in science and art, and we will do so in the beginning. We already said, you know, we uh, are in some sense free, since this also is basically the last salon of the Science Festival to do anything that we like. You know, we just can go anywhere, and I'm sure the audience will be cheering us on. Uh, but uh, in order to fulfill all our contractual obligations, so to say, we start by uh, speaking a little bit about symmetry. Um, and I think, you know, my role is here to say a few words about uh, how symmetry is viewed from the perspective of a uh, mathematician or a physicist, which, which I am, and uh, then I will ask each of you to say something briefly about, I would say kind of the canonical, just bring us up to speed, is what uh, typically is kind of, a th what the typical thoughts are that go both in design and architecture thinking about symmetry. So if I can start, you know, um, I think the kind of symmetry is clearly all around us, you know, it's, I, if it wouldn't be so dark in this room, I would kind of ask the audience to point out symmetrical objects, but clearly the room is uh, left-right symmetric to a large extent. And you now for us, as if you look in nature, we see many manifestations of it. Uh, from, just to set the stage from a mathematical perspective, a symmetry is usually seen as a movement, so you can think of reflecting something, turning left and right, or rotating something around or uh, shifting something along a certain distance. And in general, if you do that, the object changes. It's different. Uh, but if it's symmetric, then it doesn't. So for instance, a snowflake, if you return, turn it around 60 degrees, it has a hexagonal symmetry. It actually comes back to itself. If you have a checkerboard, you move it along one or two steps, then actually it returns to its original state. So it's all also about invariance. Um, it also has to do with uh, information in some sense, because it's, it's a motion you apply to an object that doesn't create something else. That's kind of the traditional role of symmetries as it was understood by the Greeks. And, 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 but then it has this tremendous story in uh, the development of science where more and more, and I hope we can have a discussion about it, became a guiding principle. So I think if you would say, if you're a modern scientist, 
And particularly if you're interested in understanding the deep structures in reality, what can you have as a guiding principle? Well, symmetry is one of these. So it's, it's one of the most fundamental tools we have. And, um, and it's, it's in many ways, I think, also a manifestation of the order there's there in nature that we all love. And that's sense why scientists have a job, because actually there's something to discover there and, and understand. So this kind of mathematical perspective, I just sketch it here. Uh, I'll come back at perhaps in later stages, but perhaps I can turn to you, uh, Paula. If you, just in broad brushes, describe the role of symmetry in design, what, what would you? Um, Annabelle will talk about architecture, but in architects and designers forever, and human beings in general, in their making of things, have been trying to imitate nature, because nature does it best. And one of the rules that they have read in nature is this rule of symmetry, which, as we know very well, is not completely real. But um, nonetheless, by trying to simplify in order to then imitate, they set out to, uh, first and foremost, try symmetry. So try symmetry first, and if it doesn't work, we can move on. So uh, when it comes to the Museum of Modern Art, it was founded in 1929, and interestingly, it was founded by three ladies of the New York Society that wanted to show how non-symmetrical modern art really was. I mean, in a way, they were, they were trying to, uh, to show something other than the old master's collection of their husbands. So I don't know if you have that picture of the um, Museum of Modern Art trustees looking at the Picasso um, uh, paintings. But already, the museum was founded in 1929. And in 1930, already there were these major exhibitions of Picasso, and clearly, if you think, yeah, you see here the Demoiselle d'Avignon in the early 1930s, that was the idea of the art that they wanted to show. But at the same time, design instead was shown for its platonic beauty. And if you don't mind going to the images of those uh, pieces of machinery, coils, and propellers. There was an exhibition in 1934 at MoMA that was considered revolutionary. It was a design show. It was called Machine Art. And there were all these propellers and uh, ball bearings and coils, exactly this one, that were shown on white pedestals as if they were Brancusi sculptures mm -hmm. and against white backgrounds. It was really revolutionary. Nobody had shown design that way. And the two curators got a lot of flack for it. But to us, this exhibition that was so innovative at that time might seem old fashioned today because it was all about the platonic beauty and the symmetry of these highly functional objects. And Philip Johnson, the curator, used this term platonic beauty. It's and a good uh, image, by the way, because, of course, Plato describes these, exactly. these objects. And it's, it's as, of course, often, and he kind of, it, it's interesting that you also said, well, we, it's difficult to find a entirely symmetric object in nature. Right. But of course, so Plato it. said, so in my mind, you know, you can have the perfect hexagon, you can have the perfect exactly. spiral. So why, come back to this point, why these, these objects, why did they actually demonstrate symmetry? What, what was, what they were was made, the exhibition telling us? Um, they were not, the designers were not trying to demonstrate symmetry. They were trying to make objects as efficient as possible. And yes. therefore, this symmetrical quality was also connected to the fact that most of them were parts of engines, yes. were like working things. Um, and it's interesting. We'll come back to that point. Yeah, the fact that symmetry is actually emerging in some sense in terms of efficiency. As a goal, exactly. Yes. Yes. But then, in the years that went between that exhibition and today, so much has changed. And especially the concept of beauty has changed, mm -hmm. which I know we're going to talk about later. So it's not only Picasso. It's also Almodovar. It's David Bowie. It's, uh, it's Muhammad Ali. You know, just to talk about the people that have brought us beyond the idea that something perfectly balanced is perfect. And today, um, we have come to embrace, in, a, in an age in which so many things can be perfectly symmetrical, we've come to really, in the world of design and in the world also of architecture, to praise also asymmetry and lack of balance. I remember how, um, this is kind of jumping, but how excited I was when I saw that there is a company in, in Portugal called Fruta Feia, which means ugly fruit, mm -hmm. that takes all the kind of like knobby and kind of 
ugly fruits, you know, like the apples that yes. are completely asymmetrical and that nobody wants, and then sells them to you for a very low price. But they were showing these beautiful baskets of really weird. Instead uh, of a platonic apple. Yes, instead yes. of the platonic <laughs> apple, the, the non-platonic yes. is so much more interesting. I must say, we saw briefly the image of the apple there. And I think <laughs> everybody at home, if, if you know it, then it's, 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 it's a simple fact. But the fact that an apple has a five-fold symmetry Many people do not know, so uh, because usually you cut an apple in four, but yeah, you should exactly. cut it in five. Just cut an apple through the middle and be amazed to see the five-fold symmetry. I just want to kind of, perhaps I can almost summarize uh, part of what you said, is that in design, it's, it's kind of a slow weaning off this kind of idea of symmetry and perfection and it has as to the do goal and going to more the asymmetric, the... Uh, yeah, but it has to do also with the computational power that has made us even um, more able and more eager to get close to nature. Yes. And by using computational power, we've discovered that symmetry is not the most important secret that you, we can use from nature in order to build. We go beyond. Yes. yes. Annabelle, you, have, you would have a, a similar a uh, view on the role of symmetry in architecture? No. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, because I think um, in the first place, it's not necessary to assign a value to either, because I think that symmetry is simply a fact. Mm -hmm. um, it's a state, it's a concept, and how it was used in, or how it is used in architecture, is... Um, in a way, if you will, a milestone. Mm -hmm. I think um, classical architecture, obviously, is is very much based on the idea of symmetry. Um, we can see it right there. Yes. Um, the Greek only ever used even numbers, for example, in, in their colonnade, so that you never had a column in the middle that then, therefore, had to split two sides. Yes, yes. Anyway, um, and there are many different kinds of symmetry, but uh, ar architecture and design probably in the 20th century or later 20th century have given symmetry a bad rep, as if like it's boring to be symmetrical. Yes. But I think well, it is boring to be symmetrical in the technical sense that if you if something is perfectly symmetric, if you see half of it, you have seen all of it, right? I think it's uninteresting to always assign values to okay. everything. I think instead, um, when you decide with deliberate effort to make something asymmetrical, you still use symmetry as a reference, yes. right? Yes. So. In some ways, for me as an architect today, I think symmetry is a tool as much as asymmetry is a tool. And there's the wonderful image of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's um, uh, Fallen Water yes. that is all about these ideas of approaching nature and so on and so forth. So I do agree that symmetry isn't the only thing yes. that gives us consideration. but. Um, it's a point of departure in some ways, and and I think it's something that's hard to get around. Our you, you faces. You must think that the kind of uh, kind of already transpired a little bit, uh, particularly because we went back to kind of the ancient times or something. That would you say that from that frame of mind, symmetry was kind of equal to perfection, or the two things had something to do? Is it is it about ap approaching something? Of well, a the concept state, of so. perfection is so incredibly difficult that take the Japanese concept, for example, uh -huh. where perfection only happens if a break um, with the complete surface actually happens, right? Uh -huh. I, I, there is a saying um, that I can't bring to mind right now. But, but in my mind, more than anything, the reason why symmetry is interesting is because, because it is a concept and because it exists, whether we like it or not. So um, to use that as a, as a point of departure is, I think, what's interesting. Uh, I was also wondering, you know, we, um, uh, if, we, if we go back to uh, actually the act of making something. I already said, you know, if, you, if you're a physicist and you want to understand the world, you... you look for guiding principles, and some of the guiding principles are that you know, if you have symmetry considerations, it constrains very much 
your, uh, the, th the forms of the theories in which you describe the world. For instance, you know, if you, uh, you want to describe the world in a way that it doesn't really depend how your precise orientation is. So there's like a, it doesn't really m matter whether the, the forces in the going north or east or west or south. Um, so it's an important guiding principle. In, in some sense, can both of you, perhaps start with you, Paula, if you, if you are a designer, something, um, what is, is, is symmetry also kind of a tool? Is it something you would kind of use? Or I, is it the guiding principle for some designers? Or It is for some designers. There are so many forms of design, <laughs> it's almost dizzying. So there's the good old fashioned furniture design, there's the product design in which you make things that go into um, the market, but then you also have visualization design in which you take data and you render them in a visual form that makes them better yes. understandable. Um, there is interface design, there is video game design. So it really is as huge as can be. But let's go to the old fashioned kind of product design. In most cases, product design tends to have symmetry as a rule. Yes. And it has to do with uh, both efficiency or the idea that you take something with your hands. And sometimes it has to do also with manufacturing constraints. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking when you have rotation molding, by definition, rotation molding with which so many bad plastic furniture and you know many plastic objects are made, that's rotation molding. So you have a rotational symmetry similarly with some, um, with some thermoplastics, you have molds that are injected, injection molds that also are symmetrical. So I would say that when it comes to physical objects, in many, most cases, um, yeah, these are the objects from the machine art show. But if you think also of more recent objects, just think of the M&Ms, uh, or think of the post-it notes, or think of so many other objects. They tend to be symmetrical. Yes. When you instead get in the kind of design that is more generated by algorithms, that is more organic, it tends to be not a rule, but something that happens if it has to happen or not. Yes. Right. Well, this kind of does relate perhaps also to, uh, and uh, by the way, yesterday we had a, a symposium on, on, on symmetry in science, and an important role was played by the fact that, in general, nature is not symmetric. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, go to a special situation, often you know, of, of minimal energy, or you, know, you can think of it of trying to pack things in the most regular way, uh, or we discussed the, 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 sh the shape of a soap bubble that tries to minimize its surface tension, you typically get symmetrical objects. Right. Uh, in fact, um, it's, it's, it's efficient. I mean, I think that's why we see it in flowers, in, uh, in, in organisms. Um, so you're basically making a point that uh, if our tools of design and production will change, and they are changing now, where they that in changing. some sense we see less, we we'll probably will see in the, in the future less and less symmetrical objects, are you thinking? I don't know, I think it's just, um, there's the other big issue with symmetry, which is beauty, and we'll deal with yes. that later. So symmetry as a mer merchandising or marketing yeah. tool. But um, I think that as we have more and more additive design and 3D printing and the idea, so many architects and designers are working on growing objects mm -hmm. and buildings as opposed to making them. So when you have a, a pavilion that, that's made by silkworms, then you know the symmetry will not be that important yes. anymore. Yes. Um, so, so kind of the difference, we think about it like a crystal or something, which is just the way in which molecules or atoms are ordered compared to a tree, yeah. which grows organically and Absolutely. has a completely uh, different kind of shape. Absolutely, and that's what many architects and designers that are doing uh, experimental work right now are taking as models. And I'm honest that you, you actually, as a, you know, a, a, an architect and leading an architectural firm, um, you, you see this symmetry as a, as, as a guiding principle in your work, or um, is it evolving in the, in the same direction that Paula is saying but I think that it's technology is changing? in the as... same direction as Paula said, but in addition to that, I think that with the onset of modernism, we've sort of taken it as an intellectual concept to mm -hmm. defy uh, symmetry. And, and I think that today we're actually past that, because if there are reasons that symmetry is useful, so to speak, if you can employ it as a tool within a set of particular circumstances, 
then so Why be not? it, as yeah. you yeah. said. Um, so I think it's not so interesting to say yay or nay, um, but I think it is interesting and sounds to me like eventually we will talk about the concept of beauty relative to symmetry. Um, there it really gets interesting because there are all sorts of social influences too. Yeah. You know? As an architect, I find it highly annoying when somebody comes to me and says, I really like symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. For informing me, I thank alert you. the media. Yeah. Was that the reason why you came to this uh, performance now? Just, uh, so, uh, s s since we now already said three times, we will discuss about Let's it. I think we should talk about beauty. Let's talk about beauty. beauty. <laughs> and uh, the, my favorite line is that uh, you know, if you talk about uh, symmetry with uh, mathematicians or physicists, they immediately will say, oh, it's beautiful. And there is not a little hint of irony in using that word. Uh, actually, my thesis is that the word beauty is only used without any conditions in a very naive fashion in science. You know, it's, uh, in, in, in art, design or something, you have to put quotation marks, you have to discuss it. We are still in this very naive uh, uh, ancient times it's where we good. just uh, uh, think it's the highest to, to, to describe. So how come, um, so let's first discuss this point, why the association between beauty and symmetry? Before we go to kind of perhaps take a view what happened you know, in the last hundred years or something, but can any of you say something about why do we even associate the word beauty with symmetrical objects. Isn't it biological? biological Isn't it that we're, that we're attracted to, I mean, as human beings, we used to be attracted in history to sim symmetry yes. for reasons maybe that had to do with like optimal procreation. I don't know, but it but seems like it's not. But if I look like at the flower, not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not we cooperating are with a flower. We are bilaterally symmetrical ourselves. So, yes. uh, to start with. There is a d degree of comfort and yes. uh, comfort and and familiarity, I think, with the idea of symmetry. I is it, by the way, a kind of a universal cultural phenomena? Absolutely, uh, across in, all in cultures any culture you of find... all, all and all epochs. Yes. Um, I think that the word though is Greek, right? And Beauty. No symmetry. Oh, symmetry. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. We're still on symmetry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and it means it includes proportion and balance yes. in dimensional um, understanding or, or in a dimensional uh, sense. And I think that sort of goes back to, to answering your question, is that is why we, why we sort of, um, why we almost cannot do without the concept of symmetry. But then it kind of evolved, Paula. So I think, you know, in, in this, very few people would use that concept anymore because of somehow our whole aesthetic has evolved. Yeah. So how I, would you well, it's describe interesting. what happened? It's interesting that you say that because at, at some point in the world of architecture and design, nobody said the B word for a while. The you B know, word. People were scared of yes. the B word. And uh, even now, I have a little bit of a hard time talking about it, and then I do openly when I have to make statements. For instance, one statement that I tend to make is that beauty is a sign of respect towards other human beings. Mm -hmm. But then I switch to aesthetic intention because when we're designers or creatives today, we cannot not take into account punk, and I mentioned before Pedro Almodovar, Dada, I mean, all the um, all of the instances and the parts of and, and the moments in history that have led us to go well beyond the idea of, t of platonic beauty. So, saying beauty still is, leads us to think of the same kind of beauty that your friends mathematicians talk about, yes. like you know this kind of symmetric beauty. So, aesthetic aesthetic intention um, lets us also take into account um, you know ugly fruit and mm -hmm. and punk and other expressions. But I do believe that. Um, giving, making effort, putting effort into the formal aspect of any kind of object is a way to communicate with other human beings. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, whether it's symmetrical or not, it is something that has to be taken into account. The fact that uh, these objects uh, correlate so strongly among cultures or something, is it, is it 
telling us something about ourselves, the fact that we universally are attracted to these objects, although we might now have a more complicated relationship to them. Undoubtedly, but there are some cultures, and I don't know enough, maybe you know more about this, Annabelle, but like for instance, let's go back to Japan, isn't a lack of symmetry praised? A lack of balance praised? Or not necessarily so? Well, I think it, it's, uh Certainly, that's my my understanding of it. Is that it's always about the tension of the two, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. And where you put into question the the familiarity, the formality, the um, the 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 commonality, if you will, of of symmetry, with something that puts that into question. I think that's where that happens. And scientifically, does symmetry create tension or not? Or it's the killing of all tensions? Um, well, I think the, the, the big difference I mean, from the scientific point of view is to look at the uh, symmetry in an object, something which uh, could kind of be boring in the sense, you know, triangle or something is not the most beautiful object that's out there. Um, but I think where mathematicians and physicists start to kind of resonate, if if you see that your theory or something is symmetrical, that your theory has, I think it's ah. almost, but it's it's it's. I would say it's almost synonymous with power. It's the, of the the mm -hmm. power of understanding things. Mm -hmm. And one way you can think about symmetry is that it somehow reduces. The, it, it's a there's an extra amount of order. If you look at a, again at a, at, 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 at a symmetrical object, if it's a round object, then you know that in some sense a, a lot of the properties of that object are described, described by its symmetry, the fact that you can rotate it around. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's symmetry in some sense enhances the power of your ideas or your theories. And, and that's actually, I think, so in that sense, the, the sense of beauty that is used by scientists is perhaps not only just the aesthetic, but it, it comes with, in some sense, it's loaded right. with an uh, incredible power of expression. And it has in some sense also to, I think typically people find an equation beautiful. That's exactly if it's what you were all saying yesterday. Explains, yeah. um, if it explains a lot with a very small number of symbols or something. But is it's there it's not that, also, that balance or something. Does that not also imply a sense of resolution? I mean, I've always thought that um, that the word resolution is actually a really interesting mm -hmm. concept in... Resolution in, in, which, in which way? Well, a beautiful equation yes. implies that you perfectly resolve um, ah, yes. a thesis, right? Yes. And to that extent, Symmetry fulfills that in, in perhaps a. Um, I, I'm sort of inept uh, finding the right words, but it seems to me that there is a sort of elegance about that resolution yes. that may be very satisfactory. Yeah. So perhaps I think you know one explanation could be that you know, scientists are so unashamed to word beauty is that they they actually have a different sense of beauty Maybe. than just yeah. that they like something or they would like to display it or something because you know probably the objects themselves are boring but yeah. it's the it's the power of perhaps I me mean, in the way you could describe that a certain movement in art is beautiful because it has been you know so creative and created right. so much so mm -hmm. that might be a different that uh, might be it yes because actually, when it comes to the formal beauty, sometimes they're a little yes. they're a little uncomfortable, as yes. we were discussing before. The B word. <laughs> I think this might be a good moment to take a few questions. And uh, what I want to do is just uh, can we put some light on the room? I don't see anything actually. Uh, uh, but we have microphones. Uh, I just stand up, and I want to take a few questions. But just raise your hands. I can't see anything here. It's a bit difficult. Turn the lights on? Okay, good. So, so there are like roving Somebody mics oh, here. Oh, oh. Uh, perfect, right. yes. There, yes. First row. Please. Mm -hmm. I will take a few questions and then pre pre present them to the, uh, to the panel. Yes, please go ahead. Sure. So um, I guess through the history of our, our species, what advancements do you think the first straight line um, gave to our made and found objects. First straight line. Straight line. Oh, okay, good. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. And other questions? 
Yes, over there, please. Uh, my question is uh, symmetry in, say, music, uh, like harmony and melody, or even in uh, like visual aesthetics. How can you how can you represent that, say, in other verbal means? Like there is harmony and melody in music, for example, mm -hmm. or even uh, artists, like when they have these paintings, the way it blends. Like there is some sort of a harmony. Is that a kind of symmetry, and is there any other way to represent it? Good. Com comes back to the, the theme of uh, of proportion, I think. Uh, let's see, is there another question at this point? Yeah, there in the back. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Yes, you please. So, so I think uh, Google just released something where they use AI to create art. Um, my question to you is, if you were to design an algorithm to create art, or to not deterministically create art, but come up with its own theory of art, how would you do that? Mm, good and question. What would you do, and how would you incorporate symmetry into that? Excellent. Uh, and I, I think we, it's on. Yeah. Uh, we often talk about symmetry visually, and I'm wondering if we could discuss symmetry through the other senses, like feeling or smell or taste. Perfect. Yes. One more, and then we go back to the panel. Uh, in discussions about symmetry, there's been words like efficiency or even resolution that's been brought up. And one word that I was curious about is the, uh, the idea of essence in, and through the idea of design. And I was wondering if that would be an interesting topic for, uh, for you guys to talk about as well. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. So uh, we recharged the conversation. Uh, I want to start with the first question about the, the, the first straight line, just a little anecdote. I have a colleague of mine and he tells the story, I think he was like six years old and was in school and the teacher tried to explain some basic geometry and he draw a line, a chalk line on the blackboard. And he said, well, this is a line. You know, uh, in, in theory, it's infinitely long and infinitely thin, but clearly that's not possible. And then my friend raised his hand and he said, well, you know, but in our minds we can think yeah. about an infinitely long line. Yeah. And then I think he was sent out of the class because it was uh, <laughs> so a poor guy. He became a very he's successful so right. physicist, yeah. but he's so right. So I want to actually turn that question around to just um, at some point, um, and it, I find it still amazing that, you know, some we can actually, even the six-year-old, can think of the concept of an infinite long line. I think if you if, if think of all of you, if you think about a line, a mathematical line, going on forever, I don't think nobody of us has problem with it. Although, you know, our mind is finite and the world we see is finite. But it's very easy to imagine. Yeah. Um, the hardest and, thing about it is that there's always a moment when it starts. Yes. Right? It's like the, the, the infinity of it is not as difficult as... It's the starting that. point. But I want to turn this around. I mean, just in some sense, it's almost going back to Plato and his images. So it's, it's for instance, easy to, if you think, think about the circle, we think about the circle. Um, so both of you, how does that, and we don't know when we first thought about these, but clearly it's very easy to think of these concepts. What is the role of these kind of mental, almost mathematical concepts and the actual in architecture, is that somehow, does it play a role? I mean, it's clearly a tension we don't, but how did that change our view of the world? Well, I think it's a perpetual change, right? Yes. As, as we become familiar with concepts, generally talked about as learning, yes. um, we can develop and evolve our way of thinking. I mean, to me, the, the question of the straight line is actually a really interesting one because, um, because it's the di perhaps it's that we think a straight line is the opposite of an organic line or an organic Because it's, you don't see them in real life, right? I mean, if, you, if you're walking uh, through the it, jungle, there are very few straight lines. Well, except that you do where, where gravity um, uh -huh. plays a role, right? Yes. Like if you... Uh, a spider drops a, mm -hmm. a thing. Thread. Yes. <laughs> thread. Um, it goes down in a straight yes. line. And, and I think our experience of straightness is actually something that is very profound and very uh -huh. old, yes. perhaps. I um, don't know where it started. 
Laura, what's your, what's your thoughts yeah, about this? I think this? that uh, we've always been able to imagine a straight line, but it's been really hard to make it happen. Like We always know what we want, but our tools are imperfect. And uh, there's a great exhibition that is open right now in Milan that is called The Prehistory of Design, which shows um, something that I've always believed, that design started when we made our first tools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it goes all the way to today, and there's some AI ideas. It's really beautiful. But so there's no, not much distance between the first spear and the AI object. It's just that we've been laboring for so many centuries to get better tools to get there. So that's really the point. You feel that in some sense when, when people were making these first tools that these mental concepts of almost mathematical concepts that are in our mind were, were guiding them? Is, that, is, is, there, is there some... Is, yes. it kind of, is there some sense of empowerment when you make something which is Definitely. close to this platonic image? Um, or close to something instead that is completely non-platonic and that is not even Euclidean because you've gone through the different steps in history that mm -hmm. led you to believe that the goal is not anymore the platonic line or the platonic yes. idea. So we, we follow our destiny. We develop and mature and make our mistakes as humanity all together. And... At every single moment, we have an idea of what we want to do, and we have this eternal frustration of not being able to make it exactly the way we want because mm -hmm. our tools are imperfect. Yes. You know? So that's the tension that I feel exists. Well, I think that, I mean, it's, uh, it's something that I, mean, I have to say something about because it, indeed, you know, it's kind of amazing that with all the examples, all the pictures we show, anything we point out that we think is a symmetric object, it's not, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you look close, it's not. These exhibitions, the coils, nothing. Yeah. they're not really symmetric. They, they remind us of these platonic images. And I think nobody can point out a perfect square, a perfect circle. If you look up close, you see little bumps. You know, it's always, so we have to work, live with these kind of failures. Um, but that's only if, if the concept of failure is, is interesting yes. to that, because I think in the first place, we think of it as a concept, and similar to being able to thinking about the infinite line, yes. if you can think of the perfect square, that gets you a long way, yes. at least for an architect. It yes. <laughs> I want to come back to a certain <coughs> a second theme that was mentioned by the, by the audience, which is indeed uh, uh, the fact that we kind of uh, very one-dimensional in the sense we have been really talking about the visual experience. Um, while I think, you know, certainly the arts and just the way we relate to the world is different. Uh, music was mentioned. In fact, again, from a scientific point of view, if you look at the power of symmetry, we say, well, there's power. We think of symmetry as movement, um, uh, turning something around or making, inverting it or, or shifting it. But in fact, another way to uh, actively do something with an object is moving it in time. You know? and, and the way the nature is, for instance, invariant under translation to time, in the fact that the laws of nature do not change minute by minute, in fact, we think they are eternal, um, is, is a very powerful principle, again, in physics, something that we find beautiful. And, uh, and music was mentioned, where, of course, you, uh, you experience, in many ways, the same kind of patterns that you see in design. There was a suggestion, what about the other senses? Uh, so is there, uh, is any, Paolo, do you want to try to dare to step in this kind of multi, multi sensual experience of designers? It's so of huge, designers? it's so huge. So um, several years ago, together with a collaborator, a colleague of mine, Jamer Hunt, we did a, a symposium um, at uh, Parsons that was called Headspace, and it was about scent. Headspace. Headspace. Yes. Headspace is a technology that is used in the perfume industry to capture the scent of living beings without damaging them. So usually you do it with camellias and, uh, you know, it's just... <laughs> Um, and um, Sorry, you have to explain that again. So it, it, it's to capture molecules of scent from 
things from <coughs> objects, from flowers, without damaging them. Mm -hmm. What it, it's, a, it's almost like a cupping, like you know when you do cupping in, uh, in Chinese acupuncture, and then it's connected to machinery that uses spectrometers, so mm -hmm. you to replicate the molecule, yeah. yeah, and then you re, and then you replicate them. So that it's called headspace technology. So we called it headspace, and it was about scent as a form of design. So. We had a whole day long of architects and uh, all of these great perfumers. But the interesting thing is that we assigned some perfumers from IFF, which is International Flavors and Fragrances. So they usually work for like Hermes or like, you know, they work for big companies. And we assigned them with some architects to create custom made scent. And one in particular, a team of two great perfumers, French, you know, with these like French perfumers like noses, were assigned to Majora Carter, that's an activist friend of mine from the Bronx, to create the perfect scent of the South Bronx. So it was fantastic. <laughs> there were like these videos that were hilarious of them arriving in Limo and the South Bronx. It was just so funny. But everybody enjoyed it tremendously. But what I uh, learned from that experience is that, of course, um, we tend to never think of, uh, uh, of scent that way, but it's an algorithm. It's, uh, uh, it's a composition of different molecules, and these big fragrance companies, um, of course, generate all sorts of artificial fragrances, but then there are some molecules that they develop and patent that are the most expensive ones, the ones that get them millions, that exist only to enhance and uh, and create a lack of symmetry, like, you know, just create the tension that you were discussing before between other molecules. So what I've come to discover is that scent, both in static and in dynamic terms, the way it starts and it has a head and a tail, blah, 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 like whiskey, um, is really about the evolution in time, and it's about creating the tension um, that is, in my ignorant mind, non-symmetrical. But then, you know, sometimes when you talk about the symmetry in music that develops over time, I'm a little lost. So maybe there's a symmetry also to scent. But definitely, non-symmetry seems more interesting yeah. to so many perfumers. One association I immediately have is that uh, because scent is such a refined notion because it actually acts at the individual molecules, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it has so many dimensions to much more than just, uh, say, sound or something. And in fact, these molecules are all, you know, are very, uh, very kind of usually asymmetric. You know? So if you take the mirror image of these molecules, you will actually, they get won't produce, get, get yeah. something completely different. Uh, and about, for you, I was also thinking in but terms I just of kind of. To say to yes, that, please. Yeah. I read somewhere that, um, as a thesis, that uh, symmetry represents um, def defying memory, whereas asymmetry supports memory. Oh, interesting. And I think that's really interesting oh, in that particular yeah. instance, especially because. So you mean that an asymmetric object that we remember it because it's like. Asymmetrical. So Asymmetrical. And, I see. and so, I mean, I concluded from that uh, that that comes to be because it's more individual and incomparable to uh, something that is immediately um, understandable. Uh -huh. But that certainly, with Works respect sense. to scent, yes. yeah. uh, makes a lot of sense. I want also to ask you in terms of a uh, number architecture and buildings, uh, what are the other senses or something that are part of the experience of a building? Is it, it's not only the visual. Well, I think <clears throat> tactility, tactility and, um, and we'll send a little bit, um, but touch. Yes. Oh, I guess tactility and touch, same thing. Yeah. Um, but um, sound, sound, of course, yes. sound I think is incredibly important. and. Reverberation. I think that in different from music, and most music is written, and therefore the sort of idea of sym symmetry in music makes some sense to me because it can occur as part of repetition or it's a sort of translation of the visual into something else. Whereas mere sound, I don't know that that is symmetrical. Connected also with, with the question was the, the concept of harmony was brought up, and we've right. already talked about balance and harmony. 
Um, harmony, I think, might be similar. Uh, the H word or something, I'm not sure. But you know, these are concepts that, again, you know, <laughs> have uh, had a very kind of platonic beginning and kind of evolved. Uh, I think actually we are entitled uh, with our discussion of symmetry to kind of move in that direction. I think so. I w want to talk a little bit about the concept of balance and harmony, and um, which which I think goes beyond symmetry or something. But it, it's a, it's uh, Annabelle, you mentioned proportions. Um, of course, there's a long-standing tradition also kind of try to capture these proportions in numbers, in mathematical numbers. Mm -hmm. There are famous numbers out of golden ancient times, the golden ratio, uh, various ways in which um, mathematical formulas try to capture these notions of balance and harmony. Um, you feel that we talked about kind of symmetry as kind of evolving. It's no longer our platonic uh, goal, and we, a lot of it is about the tension with it. Is balance and harmony still in architecture, in perhaps in your work, it's something you strive for, or and if so, how would you, how do you capture it? Um, well, oh, that's a big one. Um, I remember reading uh, an article a long time ago where Rem Kolhas said um, that striving for brutality um, in architecture was a very important concept. And is brutality the opposite of harmony? Or? Well, it's in a sense, I think it is. Yes, and unbalance. I, right, exactly, lack of balance. Um, I struggled with that statement then, and I do today, um, because I actually think there is plenty of lack of balance and lack of harmony in our lives as it is. So um, providing the opposite, providing a kind of... Um, meditational quiet is something that I think is desirable. Having said that, um, it can't happen without tension. It can't happen if it's not held in a in a um, in a sort of I don't know precious precious separation or something like that. Um, so. Right, I do, do you feel strive these, for harmony. <laughs> that these concepts of balance and they're just proportion are something which um, can be kind of almost like calculated. You think, is there some kind of, are there certain laws there? Is there some order in what makes something balanced or not? Well, is that the, evolving or personally dependent? The minute that there are laws and order, then yeah. that minute it's predictable. And I yeah. think that is what would disrupt the idea of harmony or yeah. balance. Um, I think you see a, when you experience a beautiful proportion, you immediately have a sense of balance or a, a sense of, of well-being, and that is not a bad thing. Um, but I think it's too simple to say that that's all there is. It can't, you know, it can't, it can't come to to. Um, to perfection, so to speak, if it's not held by something else. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I was thinking that but, uh, all the designers that I know, from furniture designers to visualization designers, nobody thinks of balance and harmony. Nobody? No, not, no. not anybody that I can think of. Um, the goals are different, and you know, design. So what are, happened that at some point in the history of design that was I'm kind not of uh, sure that it was abandoned. ever. I'm not sure that it was ever the goal for design. I mean, many people argue that design was born with the industrial revolution, as I mentioned to you before. It was to me much efficiency much older figure. than yeah. that, but. Um, Harmony maybe can happen, can be important in some ritualistic tools, right? Mm -hmm. So you were talking before about the meditative spaces. So there are some tools that that me, are meant to, but they, the, the goal is harmony because the goal of their use is harmony. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So uh, for these particular objects, then it's important. Otherwise, 
I'm thinking of furniture designers right now. Some deal want to have comfort. Others want to have um, the demonstration of a new technology that enables one to make knots and solidify them in a chair. So the goals are different. Hardly ever are the goals harmony for the sake mm -hmm. of it. I mean, in some sense, yes, Annabelle? Yeah, I, <clears throat> um, I think, again, similar to the word of symmetry, it doesn't uh, describe the objective that may be, um, it, it may be an inherent goal, goal to try uh, to, to strive for harmony because the intelligence of the act of making a particular object includes that. Um, but I think that it's not solely that, right? No, I, I agree. Since we have several times already mentioned the fact kind of that uh, perhaps a much more interesting topic is asymmetry, is the fact mm -hmm. that there's tension with. Um, and uh, I think there's a long tradition there too. I mean, uh, um, I think we have some images of these kind of wonderful uh, Islamic art tilings, you know, where you, they, uh, and it's actually quite lovely. Uh, they, uh, for instance, in the Alhambra, you see these wonderful tilings, and I think they were done in a kind of a, a experimental fashion, designers trying to find all possible patterns, and mathematicians now know, if that's one useful fact for all of you to take home, that there are exactly 17 different kind of wallpaper patterns. Uh, if you try to build a different kind of wallpaper patterns, and I think all 17 are, you can find them. Uh, but I think there is a, the usual phenomena that these, these, these decorations are done in an almost perfect way because there's always a small way in which it yeah, is deviating. It, of course. You have to tweak yeah. it for. Uh, so, what is our fascination with that kind of the asymmetry? Cheating? The cheating, cheating. Just, just yes. Uh, <laughs> We always like to cheat. I don't yes. know what a, fasc a, a fascination is, but I was thinking that even uh, one of the most symmetrical pieces of design is the beanbag chair, which is my favorite piece of furniture, yes. right? But it starts as symmetrical in order to accommodate any kind of asymmetry, ah, right? Yes. So, so you um, think of the beanbag line really there as great. a perfect ah, sphere. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think that we love cheating. There's nothing better when you're creating <laughs> something that's to start with a rule and then yes. to start seeing what happens when you start cheating. Yes. So, Why? Well, because I think that's creativity, right? Mm -hmm. I, it, I don't think of creativity as a, a process that is about following the rules and I don't mean I don't even want to romanticize breaking the rules it's not something that has to do with uh, a, an infantile position uh, but it's really about finding new um, new paths every moment but do you think then again going back to the, the symmetry perhaps also as kind of a metaphor for a very ordered uh, uh, you know, organized world that we need that some sense as a background in order to Definitely. make our very, I mean, in some sense, are we talking about variations on kind of a theme that is by itself perhaps True. kind of boring and discarded well, and doesn't... It's like fighting against your your father or your mother in order to grow. You yes. know, it's like the one yes. of the rules. That's why the question about the algorithm was also incredibly interesting because yes. yesterday, after hearing the panel that you were part of, after hearing all, all the scientists talk about the symmetry in equations, I went home and I, and I started thinking of the symmetry in algorithm. Algorithms are not symmetrical. They are recipes that are just starters for uh, sometimes unpredictable um, um, evolutions. And uh, I was trying to think whether the algorithm is the opposite of the equation mm -hmm. in this idea of symmetry and asymmetry. So I'm asking you, what do you think? Uh -huh. Well, it's yeah. quite interesting to ask about kind of symmetry in kind of equations because uh, no, uh, I, I love to say that if you have an equation, you know, the most part, which typically looks something like A equals B or something, and that's well, typical yeah, for uh, kind of. I mean, that, you know, uh, usually not enough attention is given to the equal sign, you know, because it's like always about A and B. You're so right. And that's the equal right. sign, I love it. It's actually perfectly symmetric. <laughs> and I always think of it as, uh, as, a, as a, a double cord cable uh, connecting A and B, and it connects A to B. 
but also connects B to A. And if you take some of the most powerful equations in physics, so I think perhaps the most famous equations equals mc squared, Einstein's equation. So what does it, what does it tell us? It tells us it's energy on the one hand equals up to some constant of proportionality, c squared, equals mass. So what does it mean? You can take energy, pure energy, and turn it into mass. You can create particles out of pure energy. And the other way, you can take particles and, for instance, as you do in a nuclear explosion, take mass and produce into energy. So it somehow takes two concepts that were not connected. It, it, it equates them, but it also it connects them. It produces a kind of a nice left-right symmetry, mm -hmm. um, which um, in, in, in many ways, and I think that's why we all call it beautiful. Why is it beautiful? Because it's, it enlarges our world. It connects two parts that didn't even need to be together. And now there's A and B, they were from different worlds, and now they're together in a simple equation. In fact, there's this nice kind of connecting piece of uh, equal sign that actually makes them talk to each other. Um, so there is, and I think that's almost like an, uh, an, um, an, I think perhaps if you th think about it, you know, the, the deepest development perhaps in mathematics has been over the say the last 100, 200 years, that instead of looking at objects, I think mathematics turned to be, used to be, you look at different objects. The modern way of looking at mathematics, all the objects are just the beginning. The question is, what are their relations? How can you go from one to the other? It sounds like and, you're talking about design. It's and what is the relation? Right? Yeah. And so what mathematicians came up with is a whole framework to think about this, so, uh, which we call category theory. And it means that if you and that's why symmetry came back. Because if you have objects, you say, well, you have a square, you have a triangle. But it's like, no, wait a moment. How can we relate these two? How can we relate the triangle to itself? Well, for instance, by rotating it over 120 degrees. So the, the symmetry is actually in terms of the relation of objects to each other, not to the object per se. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, in some sense, a that's liberating amazing. view. And I think it's very much connected to the theme that you were talking about too. It's not so much about the individual, even pieces of design, or architecture, it's, it's how do we relate to it. It's somehow having a much more connective view of the world where it's not only about the, the dots, but the various lines connecting these dots. Your question about algorithm is fascinating. I, I, I don't know whether... So uh, somebody's question here was really good. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, it, and uh, the way I view the question also is that well, suppose we, uh, and now I'm really jumping into the deep, but uh, yeah. uh, that we are, you know, uh, clearly our lives are changing through science and technology. Uh, you know, we, we have been talking something about concepts that date from the old Greeks. You know, these are 25 year old, uh, old concepts. But if you go to the here and now, where science and technology is taking <laughs> such an important role, where in many ways even thinking is machine assisted. You know, we, we're no longer, it's not just a single human being, it's human beings connected to each other, it's human beings connected to machines. Artificial intelligence will play a more and more important role. I think, certainly I know science will not stop. And I remember this is kind of famous moment when Gary Kasparov was first beaten by the chess computer in Deep Blue. And he said, well, is this the end of chess? He said, no, no, no. From now on, it's me and the machine against you know, uh, anybody else. So it's like this sense, no, we're we embracing this. Uh, I, I mean, are you, we can't think about science anymore without all our instruments, uh, our computers, uh, everything that's happening there. What happens if you just be bold and try to look at the future? Um, and I think that was what the question was uh, hinting at, mm -hmm. uh, where algorithms, combined with human efforts, will probably make design. What do you see? Well, that's already happening. It's, um, I, I see it more and more, as I was mentioning before, this idea that so many architects and designers are trying to grow objects instead of making them from the top down is based on the idea of algorithm. I don't know whether an algorithm can create art because I don't know what art is, but uh, I know that there are artists that are doing so all the time. If the algorithm says it's art, is it yeah, art? Yeah, I, I, I just, you know, that's the big question. That's she why I'm always saying there. I deal she with design. She wants to do it. Yeah, she wants to talk about no it. <laughs> but, um, but that's happening already 
all the time. It's happening in the digital space, it's happening on paper, it's happening in the 3D world and in the 5D world. So um, it's already... What's the 5D world? 5D world, you know, 5D is what is used in, um, by some production designers um, as a world-building idea. So um, the 5D it's conference 5D was created... Well, because it's um, it's... It's in the digital space, but it's definitely about world building. There's architecture uh -huh. in it. So um, it's Alex McDowell that was the, the production designer for Minority Report that coined it first. And he had created this great conference that was basically all architects and special effects people. And it was about the idea of building worlds based on not only special effects and spatial savvy, but also on narrative and game behavioral. And game yeah, technology. it's about game. Right. So it, it's already happening a lot when it comes to our space, you can talk about architecture yeah, and, uh, what, also. Tell us what, what's happening and where are we heading? Well, I Small questions. Pretty much <laughs> the last person who knows where we're headed. Um, I think architecture as I practice is, is, um, is, at the, is on its last leg. But what last I think leg. is... Definitely. I, I don't think so. I think that people will always need spaces where they feel comfortable. There is, you know, others yeah, can but what go I'm, the other what, what, I'm, what I'm very interested in is that the way we get there is diff different. Um, many young architects, as, as they're graduating, um, are becoming interested in game technology. Yes. And, and I think that's a fantastic thing because it adds a dynamic mm -hmm. to how we think about urban space and architectural space that we haven't really fully grappled. Ultimately, I think everything happens at a moment where somebody needs to make a decision. It's not that algorithms are going to decide whether something is art or not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it won't be the two of us either, or the three of us. Um, but, but the but the decision and the conversation lies with the people, right? So um, how we use our tools and how we advance to another level, and, and I think that is the fifth dimension that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, what I find fascinating, I think, you know, if you look at the, what's happening in the world of science, and again, I think we are going through the same kind of transition in the sense that, uh, no, I would say in the old days, you know, it's when you were, we were basically looking at nature and studying nature and looking at what are the natural objects that we find. Um, biologists would study all kind of organism. Uh, uh, geologists would go around and find all kind of rocks and look at crystal structures, etc. Now, now that we understand the building blocks, both of matter and of living matter, it's no more about understanding the objects that are around us. But no, 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 we are studying the space of all possible objects. Exactly. Which is vastly superior. I mean, I think Richard Dawkins made this point that if you look at every object and every organism that ever lived on planet Earth, and look and some, even on the kind of DNA code that came with all these organisms, that's a totally marginal fraction of all possible DNA. So you know, each of us you now are extremely lucky because we are the, the one design that actually was executed and it actually was produced. But uh, there's this mental space. And I think we are in both in, 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 in the life sciences with synthetic biology and in the, uh, in the say, the, the study of uh, materials in terms of nanotechnology, we're just beginning to explore that space. And I think we have we need completely different framework to approach that space because you can't do just everything. You have to find your way through this infinite space of possibilities, which is much more, of course, where design and art is. Now, the moment you take your pen and you put it on paper, you're already drawing something that nobody has drawn before. Very true, and that's yes. why there's such great collaborations that have been happening for the past eight, almost ten years between synthetic biologists and either other <coughs> scientists and designers. It's really so what fascinating. Can, uh, let me phrase it like this. Is there anything that the scientific world has to learn from the world of design and architecture to kind of deal with that kind of infinitude of possibilities? Of course, and it's already happening. And it's not really like 
learning. It's about collaborating. Mm -hmm. like, there's been um, one of the schools that in the past has done the most is the Royal College of Art in London. There used to be this course called in Design Interactions. It was a name, but in true, it was speculative design. So the designers, they were all graduate students and they were... What speculative design? It, it's about what if. So speculative what if? design, what if. Yes. Uh, speculative design is about building scenarios that are usually based on objects that talk about the possible consequences tomorrow of our choices of today. So um, they would work, especially with the scientists at Imperial College, because they were around the corner. But to give you um, to give you an example, one of my favorite objects was this menstruation machine. So it was a contraption that enabled men uh, or other non-menstruating beings to really experience a menstruation, mm -hmm. also with the cramps. I mean, Lucky them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was an example of an object. Or another year, there was a beautiful collaboration with another highly experimental school of design that does biology that is at, in Perth at UWA. So the, in, and in Perth, they, have developed, they, had, they were among the ones that had developed in vitro meat. And in London, the designers were thinking of the steak of tomorrow. Like if you can develop meat in vitro, what should a steak look like? So mm -hmm. this collaboration, and also there's another designer, uh, Daisy Ginsberg, that, that's been working a lot with Drew Andy, who's a synthetic biologist at Stanford University. So it's beautiful. Beautiful oh. to see what kind of collaborations. You use the B word. Oh yeah, yeah. the B word. <laughs> the, the, the collaborations that are happening between scientists and designers are fantastic. And I think that the reason why designers want to work with scientists, it's a no brainer. But scientists were initially diffident, but now love it because when they're working with designers, they can get out a little bit um, of the peer review system yes. that makes them sometimes timid. You know, nobody yeah. will think of these projects as replicable, as scientifically accurate. They are speculative, yes. once again. And I don't think that scientists speculate enough. Well, I'm a string theorist, so... So uh, you are <laughs> like, oh, please, yeah. We do You're speculate Mr. Happily, speculation, yeah. yeah. So Annabelle, you would say yeah, something I was just else. thinking that there are, there are uh, some very directly applicable areas where science comes together with design and architecture, and that is lighting. Um, lighting. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we perpetually look for new ways to improve artificial lighting. Yeah. It would be great to improve on this. Um, but, um, for example, there is this Italian scientist who just came up with a technology to, um, to create light as we, re as we truly experience it. It's an LED-based system. I should be able to describe it better than I can, but um, it's essentially offering the natural possibility light. to create natural light in an artificially, wow. and it's fascinating because so we'll be if if here. that really happens, yeah. you can build skylights in your basement. Yes. Amazing! Um, yes. And if you think about the the possibilities that that is going to to have for the built environment, incredible! Um, it is strictly amazing. So I think yeah. you're already swallowing your words of the last leg that you're standing on because it looks <laughs> like the beginning of uh, an exciting story. I want to kind of uh, give the audience one more uh, opportunity. So. We, we're going to struggle with the lights. We try to bring them on and do another round of questions. Let's see if we do manage to do that. Think about questions and raise your hands. If there's anything. You've been so good so far yes. with the questions. <laughs> yes. Well, let's see. One more, yes. Uh, so one would think of the, uh, I guess, the representations, physical representations in the world, the art, architecture, as a reflection of uh, the brain itself. And uh, how do you think of uh, symmetry in the sense of the representation of our minds and its manifestation in the world and, and, and how that kind of feedback loop happens? I, I know this is kind of a vague question, but... Um, trying to maybe think of how our minds play a role in... It's a good question. The brain and the mind. Yeah. Uh, other questions here. It could be quite general about the interplay of science and art over there. Yes. 
I, yeah, sorry, it's a same question that, uh, similar to question that I asked last time. I was just thinking that you have a straight line and uh, in a sound, like suppose would a constant sound be a straight line and what would be a sound that is like a circle, like a sound that repeats itself and can you add them to like get like a cylinder or a you know, pyramid? Like I'm just, you know, going on that path of uh, how do you represent different uh, similar like symmetries mentally? Okay. Okay, I can say something. There's a question over there. Thanks. Um, I remember you mentioning earlier about this 5D thing. Could you elaborate on that? I guess. Yeah, probably still want to understand why the five comes from. Is that the uh, uh, well, like just of a better definition? Good. The, Good. Any other questions? No. Yes. Here. Um, so. Uh, what would you think, and this is probably an interaction of uh, physics and symmetry, um, if there was an absence of physics or physical laws, how would that change the idea of symmetry and what you would define as symmetry? Mm, that's an interesting question. And one more, the last one there in the back. Um. This is kind of a weird question, but um, when I think of symmetry, I usually think of like infinite fractals and like infinite um, structures. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, symmetry would exist without like infinity? And like, do you think, because uh, um, with the, like most observatory things being finite, do you think like, but How do you think we can understand the infinite is necessary. Good, good question. Okay, we'll turn uh, back to our distinguished panel. Uh, Paul, I think we're all still confused about the, the, the yeah. definition of 5D. And I, I don't want to say something wrong, so I think the best would be to go to the website and see. Yes. I, can, I can describe what it was and without giving a definition. So when it was founded the first time, this 5D um, in, institute, it was the idea to have um, the three dimensions of the space plus time, plus also the idea of all the different parallel lives and worlds that you can have in a video game, as Annabelle rightly pointed out, um, and in a space that is connected digital and physical. So it was a way to, uh, to think of the, the worlds that one can build in the digital space and connecting them also to the physical world. So what Alex McDowell did is he founded this um, conference where, as I mentioned to you, was like gay, video game designers, special effects people, and architects because um, there's really a need for architectural uh, savvy in the digital space. And then now he has a, an institute at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, called World Building, in which he uses people that do special effects and that do gaming, and then architecture students and also urban design students, and they apply um, their skills to the resolution of instances. Like there's a Makoto that is an, um, uh, an area in Lagos, Nigeria, that is all on stilts, that is on the water. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to use the World Building Institute skills, so architecture plus urban design plus the ability to create whole worlds and narratives in the digital space to address issues in, them, in that particular location. So I know that I haven't answered the perfect definition and uh, I'm doing that, I'm not answering in order not to do injustice to the concept. So if you don't mind looking, at it, looking it up later on, the 5D conference and uh, 5D Institute and Alex McDowell, you'll find there the perfect definition. But it's really um, practicing architecture and urban planning using all the tools at our disposals today in a particular way. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I feel perhaps I should, should answer the question about music because it was asked twice. And, mm -hmm. uh, so one way to think about the symmetries uh, uh, in music, they have of course to do with the symmetries in time, but actually a kind of convenient way to think about it is to think about a, uh, the way the music is written uh, in, in, a, in a music score. So you can think of a music score essentially as a band of music. And you can see certain patterns. For instance, if you have a repeating phrase, it looks almost like one of these kind of uh, beautiful uh, uh, tilings that we saw 
behind us or freeze us, as well, they are used in architecture. At the, at the musical, um, music written by Bach. Yes. Uh, that's incredibly interesting because it's, it's an intensely visual experience of sound. Yeah. Um, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, you no, know, you're on. totally right. And it, I think sometimes these kind of scores, they use beautiful, they look beautiful. I mean, they have actually these symmetries. Right. Uh, you see them repeating, not quite the same. Sometimes you see inversions, so the reflection symmetry could there be too. It literally was a trick uh, in, in composing to take mm -hmm. a phrase and mm -hmm. just kind of turn it around, so sort of upside down, essentially. Um, and actually to think about it, it's perhaps, uh, now if you think about the circle, etc., it's very difficult to see circles in real life, but in some sense, they are everywhere around us because as soon as you have something that's periodic, something goes up and down, can be a, a tone, a musical note. But it could be anything. It could basically be the movement of the, the sun and the, the planets. So, of course, they are moving on orbits that to a great precision are circles. And so, in some sense, anything that is periodic in life, and if you think about it, almost everything is, uh, is in some sense an expression of symmetry because it's repeating itself in the same way as a checkerboard pattern or a freeze is repeating itself. So if you think about it like that way, invariance under movements in time are, are all around us. And in some sense, it's perhaps uh, a more, even more, you know, I think deeply ingrained experience in our brain to have something that comes and returns because it's, that's, you know, Every day come, comes and goes, and many of our experience. So there's a, there's a lot of symmetry in our lives. You know? I wonder if we can apply this also to coding. Uh -huh. I'm thinking uh -huh. there's a beautiful visualization that Ben Fry, he's a great visualization designer, did of the Pac-Man code. Yeah. He visualized, and it almost looks like um, like music. So you see the different um, the different code, and then he literally showed where the code says go back to and mm -hmm. reiterates. And so becomes, you see the same kind of visual. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, you know, that's a it's great way beautiful. to, mm -hmm. in some sense, use kind of uh, our different senses or related to mm -hmm. uh, and expresses. Um, in all of those cases, it seems that um, one. That repetition is an important yes. aspect mm -hmm. to it, no? True. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, I also want to go to the question about fractals. And um, it's, it's, it's a very, I mean, I think most of you know fractals, or they have this concept that if you zoom in, they are the same, or at least it's a variation on something. So it, it has this you know, fascinating concept of infinity, because you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, it kind of never stops. Uh, it, the kind of concept of symmetry that's involved there is a deeper kind of symmetry, a symmetry that you know, I, th I want both of you to reflect upon, which is the symmetry of a different kind of motion. It's the motion of zooming in or zooming out. So it's different from going to the left. Or, so think about you have a picture, you can shift it, you can rotate it, you can reflect it, but you can also zoom in and zoom out. And it has to do, again, with scale the various scales on which we see things. A fractal is amazing because it's, it's the equivalent of this mental image of an infinite long line that goes on and on, or the checkerboard pattern that goes on and on. It's perfectly symmetric. Of course, a real checkerboard will not. And, uh, but, um, uh, Paola, can you say something about this concept of scale and the way we think of invariance on the scaling, but perhaps also, again, breaking that symmetry? Absolutely. Of, uh, because uh, I think be, that's an important element in design. You'd be amazed how much people in the design and architecture world know about scale because there's, um, not only because of that, but there's a very famous movie by the Charles and Ray Eames, The Powers of Ten, yes. the one that starts. So it's something that every architecture and design person every thinks about. Every uh, scientist loves oh, to. Yeah, I also. It's, no, just, uh, it's so great. It's a 10 minute, I don't see you seen it, please look at it online. And it's a 10 minutes uh, movie and it captures basically everything we know about I know, nature. Yes. It's amazing. And it's perfectly uh, executed and, so good. and designed. I know. And I'm also going to make you smile because my thesis was entitled Fractal Architecture. And it was this idea that um, uh, by having, by um, overlaying a digital space and mixing it with the physical, we can really go through scales 
of a very different kind in architecture. So I think it's happening a lot. Um, uh, there was, uh, there are two um, architects, Ben Aranda and Chris Lash, that published a pamphlet, a Princeton architectural pamphlet in the, um, I think it was 2007, that was all about all the different stratagems that one can use in parametric architecture to build. So there was tiling, there was mm -hmm. pyroling, and so on and so forth. And in a way, it was um, an attempt to take fractal geometry and distill it into laws that could be applied to architecture so, and then built by computers. So it's something that is absolutely, um, that is very much used by architects and also by urban planners. There's been a lot of scale study that moved away from simply the building and went to the city, the territory, the nation. And, uh, and computers have helped us once mm -hmm. again um, make this jump in scale as I must say something that this powers of 10 is a beautiful, but it actually dates, and uh, this is my Dutch pride, it is a, was a Dutch uh, physicist who later became uh, a, an educator, and a uh, case booker, and he first thought True. of this powers of 10. It's True. a beautiful book. Uh, it's the same thing. It's like it's actually a, a, an image of a woman sitting with a baby in a in a, uh, a ch young child in a garden uh, somewhere in the middle of the Netherlands, and then he zooms in and zooms out. Zoom out. But what I loved is that he created this school, um, uh, the Werkplatz, uh, uh, and it was a uh, experimental school, and he wanted to explain the notion of scale to children. And the first design thing they had to do is to draw a brick <laughs> on a one-to-one -one scale. Ooh. Now, the thing is that we all have drawn a brick. You know, we've drawn a house, we've drawn a brick. I've never drawn a brick on a one-to-one -one scale because it's big, you know? Yeah, so the first big. thing they had to do is to draw this Eight large four, brick, and it's actually one-on-one. -on -one. It's very rare that you draw anything. Well, perhaps if you draw your hand. That's right. like an, every child uh, has done that. Um, and so for him, it was not only to think in these different scales, also to kind of ground you at the one-to-one -one scale, which is actually, in some sense, uh, I, I find yeah. that kind of a lovely image because it really... It uh, truly is. Yes. But the funny thing is that now with virtual reality, you can put yourself in the architecture and perceive it as one-to-one, -one, even yes. though you're the one that's not one anymore. You're shrunk, you know? yes. What, or you or are, whatever up. you yes. are. Yeah. But um, it really it really is happening, you know, a but lot. Yes. I, know, I think but, that's yeah. also, um, there is is some danger with that, because I think that the... Danger with the, what? With the... Um, with the with the ability of putting ourselves in, onto multiple scales, the loss of the experience of what you just described is is magnified. I think I observe that anyway in in as a as a practicing architect that the the direct understanding that happened at one time through drawing by hand the experience of of the dimension yes. is becomes more and more remote and becomes more and more theoretical. And as it becomes theoretical, it moves away from us. This is um, obviously a sort of old-fashioned argument, but I, I think that we need to actually find a way to do both, of having the sort of immediacy and tactility of how thick is your shirt, how tall is your seat, how large are your feet, mm -hmm. how big is a brick, um, to what is the dimension of the house, the city, the town, uh, the country, or uh, whatever. And, and how to negotiate that, I think, is, is immensely difficult, and I feel like we have a long ways to go to tackle that. So you don't think that the new means of uh of uh, reproduction, like you know, virtual reality help? Well, they do and they don't. I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, we are enabled in ways that are mind-boggling. Um, at the same time, I notice how, how people lose the direct touch with, the, with that dimension. And I, I mean very specifically dimension. <coughs> It's just an observation you make because we're so focused on 
on the vast amount of, of things that we can do, that the very close um, understanding of that dimension is difficult to, to grapple with. So it's, it's a fascinating theme that uh, you know, we are going through <coughs> all these kind of transitions you now. Uh, and, uh, and although we, we talk about a concept, I was thinking of the concept that we talked about today, which is the naive way beauty of symmetry, et cetera, is something that you probably could have talked to somebody who left 2,000 or 4,000 years ago, you know, it's something, yeah. it's, 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 it's not a new topic or something. On the other hand, you know, uh, particularly though both the world and science and art has gone through these spectacular developments. You know? So it's kind of, it's, and, and, and as we just said, you know, we are probably really only at the beginning of what's going on because now technology will completely change uh, the way we approach uh, the, the, both of these fields. Um, and so I want to ask you both to kind of speculate um, the kind of discussion that we're having right now is that, um, is that a discussion that we will keep on having, is that kind of tension? Because I, one thing I kind of picked up in basically everything that you said, uh, both of you said, is that you know, there, is these, there are these mental images, there are these beautiful concepts, platonic images, which, you know, and, but they create this kind of tension what, what we, of what we want to create and how the world that we want to live in. Something. Is that something that will kind of stay with us, or is this a subject that at some point is kind of I over and out? I believe it'll stay with us. I believe we'll always feel inadequate. We'll always feel that we want to do better. We, I, I, it's in human nature. I hope that we will keep on yes. having this discussion over yes. and over. Of course, the context will change, the tools will change, but we will want, always want more. What is the essence then? What is the essence of that tension? I think the essence of the tension is, is never being able to reach the ultimate goal, whether it's perfection or whether it's uh, saving the environment, but being better than we are. It's always like we always have a carrot in front mm -hmm. of us. So just mm -hmm. changing that platonic image of uh, that platonic. You see, uh, platonic images don't do that much for no. me anymore. It's just chasing the image of what that better would be. Yes. You know, and maybe it's completely not platonic. Maybe it's brutal. You know, and uh, so you say the actual concept of this kind of perfection is changing and the and concept evolving. of the unattainable. Yes. You know, there's always something more. Yes. And I was watching the other day, um, there's um, a, a British woman that I love so much. She's done a lot of body modification. She's done also <laughs> the eyeball tattoo where you, you become the, uh, the white or the eye becomes like bright blue. And so I just went, I started browsing all these body modifications that happened because I didn't know much about it. It's amazing what some human beings put themselves through to achieve whatever image they have that is definitely not platonic yes. Yes. of what it is that they want to <laughs> yes. achieve, right? Yes. So I think that that's a metaphor for all of for us. For the struggle. Uh, whatever, we will keep on struggling for something more and beyond. Yes. Annabelle, can you relate to that? Um, well, I, I happened to read the New York Times um, book section this weekend, and there was an article about um, a German man who was born with very limited limbs. And he became fascinating to people because he was unbelievably capable in the course of his life. He not only fathered 14 children <laughs> but, and had multiple wives who he outlived, but he was capable of making these incredibly um, sophisticated, mm, like, um, miniature manuscripts, and there's a there is an exhibition now I can't remember where um, of of all of the works that he did. And why was I thinking of that? Because you were talking now and earlier about our inability to create the perfect tools. And while I think that this this infinite struggle, of course, goes on, um, but I think. In my mind, the, the, the tension comes from, from the achieving, from the eureka moment to the having to push the envelope to the next thing. And I think that if there wasn't every once in a while this sort of 
elated moment of saying, we did achieve, if not perfection, something that's very, if, if we couldn't experience the, have the pleasure of the experience of nature or the pleasure of experiencing art in its purest way, whatever that may be, um, I think we wouldn't be able to go to struggle to the next thing. By the way, it was at the Met, that exhibition. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. that's, that's, that's well, right. I really want to see that show. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway. I think that's actually we taking you both points of view together. It's kind of I feel we're kind of approaching perfect end of this uh, this uh, salon because it's uh, what I take away from this is that you know we are kind of placed in between this kind of uh, world of perfection and symmetry and the asymmetry and the chaos. It's like this kind of perfect place where we as human beings can you know can define ourselves uh, as as struggling. Uh, to 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 reach a certain goal which we never reach, but yet you know we have this great gift that there is so much order around us that makes mm -hmm. it uh, makes it possible. So I think uh, <laughs> I, I think in terms of that char uh, no. challenge. Uh, uh, sorry. No, I was looking at the image. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, much. it's pretty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Asher captured it all. I think you know that might be the feeling the audience has when it was kind of following our dialogue. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I just want to thank both of you because uh, clearly this uh, was a grand topic. Mm -hmm. um, it could get any way. And uh, I think in the same way we just say that, you know, we are, we're struggling to do the impossible. I think both yeah. of you did. Uh, I think you did it very successfully. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for enlightening us with your Great ideas. Great moderation. Thank you. Thank you.